the Sharangama Sutra, Fascicle 4 of 10. Chapter 2, The Phenomenon in the Tathagata Store. The meditative study of all as unreal, or samapati. The one mind being the source of both delusion and enlightenment. Purna Maitrayani Putra, who was in the assembly, rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt upon his right knee, reverently joined the palms of his hands, and said to the Buddha, O oh, august and world-honored one, you have revealed the Tathagata's meaning so well to all living beings. The Buddha has always declared that I surpass all men in preaching the Dharma, but as I now listen to his melodious and deep Dharma voice, I am like a deaf man striving to hear flies and mosquitoes a hundred feet away. He cannot see, still less can he hear them. In spite of what the Buddha taught to cut off our delusion, I fail to understand its ultimate meaning which is altogether beyond me. Word honored one, it is reasonable that those like Ananda who have merely opened their minds but have not cast away their worldly habits do not understand it. But though I and others here have reached a state beyond the stream of transmigration, we are still not quite clear about the Dharma just taught by the Tathagata. Word honored one, if all things such as the sense organs and data, aggregates, entrances, and fields of sense are fundamentally the pure and clean Tathagata store. Why does the latter suddenly create mountains, rivers, the great world, and all other forms that rise and fall in turn without interruption? The Tathagata has also spoken of the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind whose natures mix and pervade the whole dharma realm in which they remain all the time. Word honored one, if the element of earth was all embracing, how could it contain the elements of water? If the latter was all pervading, there would be no fire. Then how can one be clear that these two elements pervade all space without destroying each other? Word honored one, the nature of earth is obstructive while that of space is the reverse. How can both of them pervade the whole Dharma realm? I really do not understand. May the Tathagata be compassionate enough to enlighten me and so dispel the clouds of my delusion. After saying this, he prostrated and eagerly awaited the holy teaching. The Buddha said to Purna Maitrayani Putra and all arhats in the assembly who had reached the state beyond samsaric transmigration and beyond further study. The Tathagata now expounds the highest transcendental truth so that those hearers with settled minds and arhats who have not yet realized that neither ego nor dharma exist and who seek reality will know the correct practice of the passionlessness of the supreme vehicle. Listen attentively to what I say. Purna Maitrayani Putra and the assembly kept silent, awaiting with reverence the Buddha's Dharma voice. The Buddha asked, Purna Maitrayani Putra, you now ask why that which is fundamentally pure and clean suddenly created mountains, rivers, and great earth. But have you not heard the Buddha declare that self-natured Bodhi is absolute and enlightened, and that basic Bodhi is enlightened and absolute? Purna Maitrayani Putra replied, Yes, word honored one, I have heard this. A probe into the disciples' understanding of noumenon and phenomenon to reveal the rise of illusions. The Buddha asked, when you speak of Bodhi and enlightenment, do you mean that because of its enlightened nature you call it Bodhi? Or because of its basic unenlightened nature you now call it enlightened Bodhi? The real missed by cognizance of the false. Purna Maitriyani Putra said, If that which is unenlightened is called Bodhi, it is not aware of anything. The three finer conditions of unenlightenment basic ignorance, subject and object, the Buddha said. You say that that which is not aware of anything is not enlightened Bodhi, but that which creates an illusory object is unenlightened, 
and that which abstains from so doing is free from subjective awareness. The unenlightened is certainly not the clean nature of Bodhi, for self-natured Bodhi is essentially enlightened, but is mistaken for enlightened awareness. Bodhi is not that awareness of things, for such awareness sets up objects, and the setting up of illusory objects implies an illusory subject. The six coarser conditions of unenlightenment. Thus, from that which was beyond both identity and diversity arose all differences. When the differentiating subject confronted its differentiated objects, the resultant diversity led to identification. Identity and diversity further led to that which was neither the same nor different. These conflicting disturbances resulted in troubled perception, which in time gave rise to objective form. Self-created confusion, caused by clinging to names, caused karmic activity, and so suffering. That which manifested became the changing world, and that which was still was space. Hence, space stands for identity, and the world for diversity, and that which is neither the same nor different is a living being. The Law of Continuity Continuity of the Physical Universe Sustained confrontation of subjective awareness with objective dim voidness produced vibration and movement, hence the wheel of wind in constant motion in the universe. Awareness so shaken by the void was benumbed by it and hardened into the element of metal. Hence, the wheel of metal to preserve the earth. When the movement caused by awareness produced wind and hardened into metal, the friction between wind and metal flashed fire, the nature of which was transformative. Fire sprang up and melted metal. Hence, the wheel of water pervades all the worlds in the ten directions. The meeting of rising fire with falling water formed wet oceans and dry continents. This is why fire sometimes rises from the bottom of the seas and streams and rivers flow over continents. Excess of water over fire resulted in the formation of high mountains. Hence, rock sparks when struck and melts when submitted to great enough heat. An excess of earth over water resulted in the growth of vegetation. Hence, a forest fire reduces the trees to ashes, that is, earth, and a plant bleeds when twisted. Thus, these illusory four wheels intermingled and became mutual seeds to ensure the continuity of the world. Continuity of Living Beings Further, Purnamitriani Putra, this defect in awareness was caused by its subjectiveness that set up illusory objects beyond which awareness thus circumscribed cannot reach. Hence, one's hearing is limited to sound, and one's seeing to form. The six illusory sense data thus created divided the undivided nature into seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing. As a result of unenlightened activities, similarity of karma caused affinity, whereas dissimilarity led to either union for embodiment or parting for transformation. When the perception of an attractive light reveals an illusory form, the clearness of the latter stimulates a keen desire for it. Opposing views cause hatred, whereas concordant ones lead to love the flow of which becomes the seed germ which, by uniting with craving, forms a fetus. Thus, sexual intercourse attracts those who share the same karma and causes the five states of a fetus. Therefore, the four forms of birth derive from particular causes. Birth from an egg is due to the predominance of thoughts, that from a womb to passions, that from humidity to responsive union, and that by transformation to parting and metamorphosis. The union and parting of thoughts and passions cause further changes and transformations which rise and fall, closely followed by living beings, who are thus subject to the retributive effects of their karma. Hence the continuity of the realm of living beings.
continuity of karmic retribution. Purna Maitrayani Putra, since desire and love are tied so closely together, no disengagement is possible, and the result is an endless succession of the births of parents, children, and grandchildren. This comes mainly from sexual desire, which is stimulated by love. Since passion cannot be destroyed, living beings born from wombs, eggs, humidity, and by transformation tend to use their strength to kill each other for food. This comes mainly from their passion for killing. So if a man kills a sheep to eat its meat, the sheep will be reborn as a human being, and the man after his death will be reborn as a sheep to repay his former debt. Thus, living beings of the ten states of birth devour each other and so form evil karma which will have no end. This comes mainly from their passion for stealing due to such causes as, you owe me my life, and I pay my debt. Living beings are subject to birth and death for hundreds and thousands of eons. Due to such causes as, you treasure my heart, I love your beauty. They continue to be tied to each other for hundreds and thousands of kalpa. Therefore, the basic causes of continuous karmic retribution are three, killing, stealing, and carnality. Thus, Purnamaitrayani Putra, these three evil causes succeed one another solely because of unenlightened awareness which gives rise to the perception of form and so sees false mountains, rivers, and the great earth, as well as other phenomena which unfold in succession and, because of this very illusion, appear again and again as on a turning wheel. The Uncreated and Unending Porna Maitriani Putra asked, If Bodhi, which is basically absolute and enlightened, and is the same as the unchanging Tathagata mind, can suddenly create mountains, rivers, the great earth, and other phenomena, when will the Buddha, who has attained absolute enlightenment, again give rise to the worldly perception of mountains, rivers, and the great earth? The Buddha said, Porna Maitriani Putra, if a man loses his way to a village by mistaking south for north, does his error come from delusion or enlightenment? Purna Maitriani Putra replied, From neither. Why? Because, since delusion has no root, how can this error come from it? Since enlightenment does not beget delusion, how can it cause him to err? The Buddha asked, If this man while erring, suddenly meets someone who shows him the right way. Do you think in spite of his mistake, he will lose his way again? Purnamaitriyani Putra replied, No word honored one. The Buddha said, Purnamaitriyani Putra, it is the same with all Buddhas in the ten directions. Delusion has no root, for it has no self-nature. Fundamentally, there has never been delusion, and though there is some semblance of it, when one is awakened, it vanishes, for Bodhi does not beget it. This is like a man suffering from an optical illusion who sees flowers in the sky. If he is cured, these flowers will disappear. But if he waits for them to appear again, do you call him stupid or intelligent? Purnamaitriyani Putra replied, Fundamentally, space has no flowers but due to defective sight they are seen as being in the void. This is already a false attitude. If in addition they are required to appear again, this is mere folly. How then can that man be called stupid or intelligent? The Buddha said, Since you have interpreted well the non-existence of flowers in the sky, why do you still ask me about the immaterial absolute Bodhi of all Buddhas creating mountains, rivers, and the great earth? It is like ore, which contains pure gold. Once the latter is extracted, it cannot be mixed with the ore again. It is also like the ashes of burnt wood, which cannot become wood again. It is the same with all Buddhas of the Nirvanic Enlightenment. The unhindered intermingling of noumenon and phenomenon. 
Purnamitriani Putra, you now ask about the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, which fundamentally intermingle without hindrance in the Dharma realm. You are in doubt about why the elements of water and fire do not destroy each other, and how the elements of space and earth can contain each other. Purnamitriani Putra, take for instance space, which differs greatly from all forms, but which does not prevent them from manifesting in it. Why? Because space is radiant in the sun and dark when the sky is cloudy. It moves with the wind, is bright in a clear sky, hazy in mist, obscure in a dust storm, and is reflected when above clear water. Do you think that these transient forms in different places are created by these conditions, or that they come from space? If they come from these conditions, then when the sun shines, there is sunlight, and all the worlds in the ten directions should be identical with the sun. Then why is the sun seen in the sky? If space shines, it should shine upon itself. Why then at night, or when there are clouds and fog, is there no light? Light, therefore, is neither the same as nor different from sun and space. Thus, when looked into, essentially there are no forms, that is, the seven elements, for they cannot be pointed out like unreal flowers in the sky that can only produce unreal fruit. So why do you inquire about their mutual destruction? But when their underlying nature is looked into, it is fundamentally real, for it is absolute Bodhi. Since this absolute enlightened mind is basically neither water nor fire, why do you question their mutual hindrance? Within this true and absolute Bodhi enlightenment, if you give rise to the karmic illusion of space, space will manifest. If you have similar illusions of earth, water, fire, and wind, one after another, they will manifest separately, and if you give rise to them all, they will appear simultaneously. Purnamitriani Putra, what does simultaneous appearance mean? If two men walking in opposite directions see the sun reflected in water, each will see the reflection follow in his direction. There is no fixed standard here, and you cannot query why one sun can move in opposite directions, or why two suns are seen when only one appears in the sky, thereby deepening your delusion without any prop on which to hold. Expounding the common source of delusion and enlightenment to sum up the intermingling of phenomenon and noumenon. Purnamitriani Putra, because you cling to form and space that displace each other in the Tathagata store, the latter, in accordance with your karma, manifests as space and form which pervade the whole dharma realm, and as a result there appear within it the blowing wind, still voidness, a bright sun, and dark clouds. Due to their delusion and perplexity, living beings turn their backs on Bodhi and cling to sense objects, thereby giving rise to troubles or klesha, with the resultant appearance of illusory forms. As to me, my uncreated and unending profound enlightenment accords with the Tathagata store, which is absolute Bodhi, and ensures my perfect insight into the Dharma realm where the One is infinite and the infinite is One, where the large manifests in the small and vice versa, where the immovable Bodhi mandala appears everywhere where my body embraces the ten directions of inexhaustible space, where the kingdom of treasures, that is the Buddha land, appears on the tip of a hair, and where I sit in a speck of dust to turn the wheel of the Dharma. As I have wiped out all illusory objects of senses to accord with Bodhi, I have realized the nature of the absolute enlightenment of the Buddha Tathata. Chapter 3, The Tathagata Store Containing Both Noumenon and Phenomenon Meditative Study of the Mean or Dhyana Elimination of Is to Reveal the True Mind 
the fundamental, absolute, and perfect mind of the Tathagata store is neither mind nor the elements of space, earth, water, wind, and fire. Neither eye nor ear, nose, tongue, body, or intellect. Neither form nor sound, smell, taste, touch, nor idea or dharma. Neither the field of sight perception nor the other fields of sense, including that of the intellect. Neither enlightenment nor unenlightenment nor the eleven other links in the chain of existence, including old age and death. Neither the end of enlightenment nor that of unenlightenment, nor that of the eleven other links. Neither misery nor the accumulation of misery, extinction of passion and the path thereto. Neither wisdom nor gain or realization. Neither charity or dana, nor discipline or sila. Neither zeal or virya. Neither patience, kshante, meditation, dhyana, wisdom, prajna, nor perfection, or paramita. And even neither tathagata, arhat, samyak sambodhi, pari nirvana, nor true eternity, bliss, self, and purity. Elimination of is not to reveal the true mind. Thus, the basic enlightened mind of the Tathagata store, being neither mundane nor supramundane, is wonderful in that it is also identical with worldly mind and the elements of space, earth, water, wind, and fire. With eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and intellect. With form, sound, smell, taste, touch, and ideas. With the field of eye perception and all the other fields before and including that of intellect with enlightenment, unenlightenment, and the eleven other links in the chain of existence before and including old age and death, with the end of enlightenment, of unenlightenment, and of the eleven other links, with misery and its accumulation, with the extinction of passions and the path thereto, with dana, sila, virya, kshante, dhyana, prajna, and paramita, and also with tathagata, Arhat, Samyak Sambodhi, Pari Nirvana, True Eternity, Bliss, Self, and Purity. Simultaneous elimination of is and is not to reveal the Absolute Mind. Thus, the underlying principle of the Absolute Enlightened Mind of the Tathagata Store being identical with and including both the mundane and supramundane is above is and is not, and beyond both identity and difference. How, therefore, can worldly beings of the three realms of existence and in the supramundane Shravaka and Pratyeka Buddha states fathom the Tathagata Supreme Bodhi and penetrate the Buddha wisdom by word and speech? For instance, though a lute can make sweet melody, it is useless in the absence of skillful fingers. It is the same with you and all living beings, for although the true mind of precious Bodhi is complete within every man, when I press my finger on it, the ocean symbol radiates, but as soon as your mind moves, all troubles or klesha arise. This is due to your remissness in your search for supreme Bodhi, in your delight in Hinayana, and your contentment with the little progress which you regard as complete. The One Mind, Sudden Awakening and Realization Purnamitriyani Putra said, The Buddha and I possess the true, absolute and clean minds of complete enlightenment, which are the same and wholly perfect. But why, after so many transmigrations due to my delusion from the time without beginning and after my present attainment of the saintly vehicle, Am I still unable to realize the ultimate, whereas the world-honored one has eliminated all falseness and has realized absolute permanence? I beg to ask the Tathagata what causes the delusion that screens living beings from their profound enlightenment and so subjects them to their present position. The Buddha replied, Although you have wiped out your troubles or klesha, Traces of your defilement still remain. I will now put some worldly questions to you. 
Have you not heard of the madman, Yajnadatta of Shravasti, who would look into a mirror and delight in seeing his eyebrows and eyes? But when one morning he failed to see them in his own head, thought himself bedeviled. Do you think there was any valid reason for such madness? Purna Maitriani Putra replied, There was no valid reason. The Buddha said, The absolute Bodhi is basically enlightened and absolute. When it is screened and wrongly called false, how can there be a real cause of this delusion? For if there is a real reason, how can it be called false? All this arises from wrong thinking, which develops into further wrong thinking. When one falseness is heaped on another, in spite of the teachings by Buddhas and countless former eons, you are still unable to avoid delusion. Its causes are also under delusion. But if you realize that it has none, falseness will have no support and will vanish. Since delusion was never created, what is there to destroy to realize Bodhi? This is like a man who, when awake, relates what he saw in a dream. He may be ingenious, but what can he get from it? Still less can he benefit from a state which does not derive from any cause and does not really exist. Like Yajnadatta, who, without reason, took fright at not seeing his own head. If he suddenly ceased to be crazy, his head would not come from elsewhere, and even if he was still mad, it was not really lost. Purnamitriyani Putra, since this is the nature of falseness, where is its cause? If you will only cease to discriminate and to believe in the three illusions that there are the universe, karmic retribution, and the realm of living beings, the three conditions derived from killing, stealing, and carnality will come to an end. Without these conditions, the three causes will not arise, and, as with mad Yajnadatta, the mad nature of your own mind will come to an end, and when it does, that is enlightenment or Bodhi. Thus, your unexcelled, pure, and enlightened mind, which essentially pervades the Dharma realm, does not come from outside. How can it be realized by toilsome and profound practice and by achievement? This is like a man with a Chintamani pearl sewed in his coat who forgets all about it, thinks he is really poor, and wanders about begging for food. Although he is poor, his pearl has never been lost. If a wise man suddenly tells him that it is in his coat, all his wishes will be answered and he will become very rich. He will thus realize that his wonderful gem does not come from outside. Ananda then came forward, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, stood up and asked, the World Honored One now speaks of eliminating the three conditions of killing, stealing, and carnality to ensure that the three basic causes do not arise, and so to stop the upsurge of Yajanadatta's madness and realize Bodhi, which does not come from the outside. This, without a shadow of doubt, shows the causes and conditions. But why does the Tathagata throw them away completely? It is also due to causes and conditions that my mind has opened. World Honored One, I am not the only hearer, Shravaka, who, though still needing study and learning, has so awakened. But others in this assembly, like Mahamad Gayayana, Sariputra, Subhuti, etc., who followed the Brahmacharan, heard of the Buddha's teaching on causes and conditions, then awaken to the Dharma and achieve the state beyond transmigration. If you now say that Bodhi does not depend on causes and conditions, then the self-existence such as preached by heretics in Rajagriha, such as Maskari Gasalaputra and others would be Nirvana. Will you be so compassionate enough to enlighten my delusion and perplexity? The Buddha said, Ananda, in the case of Yajnadatta, if the so-called cause and condition of his madness had been wiped out, his own nature, which was not mad, 
would have revealed itself. And whatever you may rationalize about cause, condition, and self-existence does not go beyond this. Ananda, if Yajnadatta's head had basically been self-existent, it should always have been so, and could not have been otherwise. What then were the cause and condition that resulted in his taking fright and going mad? If his self-existent head became mad owing to cause and condition, why was it not lost? But when he took fright and went mad, why was it still there, unchanged? Thus, how could cause and condition affect his head? If his madness was self-existent, it should always have been there. But before he became mad, where was it hidden? If his madness was not self-existent and there was nothing seriously wrong with his head, why did he go mad? If you realize that his fundamental head was intact, you will know that only his consciousness became mad and will realize that to talk of cause, condition, and self-existence is frivolous. This is why I say that if the three conditions of killing, stealing, and carnality are eliminated, this is Bodhi mind. But the idea that Bodhi mind is created after the samsaric mind has been annihilated pertains to samsara. Even after the ideas of both creation and destruction have been abandoned, with no more thought of practice and realization, if the least belief in self-existence remains, this shows clearly that the death of the worldly has given birth to the self-existent mind, which also pertains to samsara with its implied opposite, self-existence. This is like the mixture and fusion of various worldly materials into a composite compound which implies its opposite, the uncompounded. But the absolute, which is neither original nor unoriginal, neither mixed and united nor not mixed and not united, and neither apart nor not apart from union and separation, is above and beyond all sophistry. Bodhi and Nirvana are still very far away and cannot be attained without eons of practice and experience. Even if you succeed in memorizing the twelve divisions of the Mahayana canon taught by all the Buddhas and the profound and perfect doctrines countless as the Ganges sands, this will only increase sophistry. Although you speak of cause, condition, and self-existence as if you are very clear about them, and in spite of people calling you the first of those with a wide knowledge of the Dharma, with its beneficial influence for eons past, you have been unable to avoid the pit into which Matanji fell. Why have you waited to be rescued from it by my Surangama mantra which caused the girl to extinguish the fire of lust completely? to realize the state of Anagaman and to enter the dense forest of zeal and devotion. As the river of love dried up, you were delivered from bondage. Therefore, Ananda, your memorizing and remembering the Tathagata's profound and wonderful teaching for successive eons cannot compare with one day's practice of the transcendental path which has enabled you to avoid suffering from both love and hate. Matanji was a prostitute, but she gave up lust and desire with the aid of the mantra, thereby becoming a bhikshuni called self-nature in this assembly. Both she and Yasodhara, the mother of my elder son Raula, awoke to sufferings caused by desire and love in their previous lives and, in a flash of thought, practiced the transcendental way. One was freed from bonds, and the other received my prediction of her future enlightenment. Why do you still deceive yourself by clinging to what you see and hear? Chapter 4 Self-Enlightenment Objects Contemplated in Meditative Studies After hearing the Buddha's teaching, Ananda and the assembly, now rid of doubts and illusion, awoke to reality and felt a lightness of body and mind which they had never experienced before. Ananda again wept, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, knelt down, brought his palms together and said, 
O peerless, compassionate, and immaculate King of Treasures, you have opened my mind so well by using all kinds of expedience and encouragement to lead me out of darkness in the ocean of suffering. World Honored One, after hearing your Dharma voice, although I have realized that the bright mind of Absolute Bodhi of the Tathagata store pervades the ten directions to bring all the lands therein to the pure and majestic kingdom of Absolute Enlightenment, the Buddha again blames my useless knowledge acquired by listening, which cannot compare with true practice and training. I am like a traveler who is suddenly given by the King of Heaven a splendid mansion, which now that he owns it, he should know how to enter. May the Tathagata not forsake his great compassion, and may he teach all the deluded in this assembly how to give up the small vehicle and how to develop their minds in order to attain the ultimate nirvana, so that those who still need study and learning may know how to overcome their clinging to causal phenomena in order to achieve perfect control, dharani, and enter the Buddha's all wisdom. After saying this, he prostrated himself and reverently awaited the holy teaching. Practice of meditation for self-enlightenment. The Buddha took pity on the Shravakas and Pradyeka Buddhas in the assembly, whose minds set on enlightenment were still not at ease, and also on future living beings in the Dharma ending age, who will want to develop their Bodhi minds and to tread the path of the Supreme Vehicle. He said to Ananda in the assembly, As you are determined to develop the Bodhi mind, and practice the Tathagata Samadhi tirelessly, you should first ascertain the two decisive factors in the development of your mind. What are they? The subjective mind in the meditation. Ananda, as you decide to give up the state of a Shravaka to practice with the Bodhisattva vehicle in order to possess the Buddha's all wisdom, you should see clearly if the cause ground used as a point of departure and its fruit ground, that is, realization, are compatible or not. Ananda, if you use your worldly mind as a causal point of departure, you will fail in your search for the Buddha vehicle, which is beyond birth and death. Therefore, you should inquire into all the creations of the mind, which in this material world are subject to change and destruction. Ananda, which one of them does not decay? Yet you have never heard that space can perish. Why? Because it is not a created thing. The Objective Phenomena in the Meditation In your body, that which is solid is the element of earth. That which is liquid is the element of water. That which is warm is the element of fire. And that which moves is the element of wind. These four restraining elements divide your pure, perfect, absolute, and enlightened Bodhi into seeing, hearing, knowing, and discerning. Hence the five turbid conditions, or kasaya, from the beginning to the end. What is turbidity? Ananda, take for instance clear water, which is so by nature, and dust, earth, ashes, and sand, which are obstructive by nature. If someone throws earth and dust into clear water, the former will lose their obstructive qualities, and the latter its clearness. The result is dirty water, which is called turbid. Your five turbid conditions are like that dirty water. Ananda, when you see space in the ten directions, your perception and the void are inseparable. And since the void is bodiless and your perception unenlightened, both unite into one falseness, which is the first layer, called turbid kalpa. Your body is made of the four elements which limit your mind and divide it into seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing. The union of water, fire, wind, and earth with your feeling and knowing begets another falseness, which is the second layer, called turbid views. Your recollection and habits give rise to intellection, which responds to the six sense data. 
This intellect has no independent form apart from the objects of sense, and is devoid of nature apart from perception. It unites with sense data to become another falseness, which is the third layer, called turbid passions, or klesha. In the endless rise and fall of illusions and samsara, your intellect is intent on staying in the world, whereas your karma forces you to transmigrate from place to place. They thus unite into another falseness, which is the fourth layer called turbid being. Fundamentally, your seeing and hearing are, by nature, the same. But, being limited by sense data, they degenerate into two separate faculties. They are aware of each other within their common nature, but differ in their functions. As a result, they are, as it were, upside down and unite into another falseness, which is the fifth layer called turbid life. The Point of Departure Ananda, if you wish to bring your seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing into line with the Tathagata's absolute eternity, bliss, self, and purity, you should first pick out the root of birth and death and turn its worldly falseness back to its unworldly, profound nature until it is subdued and reverts to basic Bodhi, and then use this pure nature as the causal mind ground, that is, as the point of departure, to perfect your practice and realization of the fruit ground. This is like purifying muddy water in a clean container. Left unshaken in complete calmness, the sand and mud will sink to the bottom, when the clear water appears, this is called the first suppression of the intruding evil element of passion. When the mud has been removed, leaving behind only the clear water, this is called the permanent cutting off of basic ignorance. Enlightenment is pure and unmixed, and its manifestations are not of the nature of klesha, but are in accord with the immaculate virtues of nirvana. Looking into the roots of Klesha to find the sense organ suitable for meditation. What is the second decisive factor? In your determination to develop the Bodhi mind and to advance boldly along the Bodhisattva path by relinquishing everything worldly, you should look closely into the origin of Klesha, caused by your basic ignorance and developing discrimination, and see who creates and endures them. Ananda, in your cultivation of Bodhi, if you do not inquire into the root of Klesha, you will never know how and where the organs and sense data are turned upside down. If you fail to understand this, how can you overcome them to win the Tathagata stage? Ananda, if a man who is good at untying knots does not see them, how can he undo them? And you have never heard that the void can be unfastened, for it has neither form nor shape and is not like a knot that can be untied. But your eyes, ears, nose, and tongue, as well as your body and mind, are the six decoys which a thief uses to steal the treasures of your house. For this reason, since the time without beginning, living beings in this world have always been interlocked in time and space. Hence, you are unable to leap beyond the material world. Ananda what is this realm of time and space? Time means duration, and space, location. You know that the ten directions are in space, and that the past, present, and future are in time. There are ten directions of space, and three aspects of time. All living beings owe their bodies to illusory time and space, which are interwoven within them and continue to affect them. Although there are ten directions, the worldly man recognizes only the east, west, south, and north as cardinal points, but disregards the intermediate ones and the zenith and nadir, which he considers as unimportant. The entanglement of the three times with the four cardinal points, that is, three by four, or of the four cardinal points with the three times, that is, four by three, results in the constant twelve. Allowing for the change and transformation of discriminative thoughts occurring thrice to cover the past, present, and future, this constant is increased from 1 to 10, 100, and 1,000 
to cover the whole field of activity of each of the six sense organs. Its maximum sum of merits, that is, its potential function, being represented by the number 1200. Ananda, now measure the potentiality for merit of each organ. For instance, your eyes can see things in front and on both sides, but nothing behind you. Its incomplete field of activity represents only two-thirds of the maximum, that is, only 800 merits. As to your ears, their field of activity includes all the ten directions. A sound is heard whether near or distant, while silence is registered as being boundless. Hence, this organ earns the full 1,200 merits. The function of your nose relies on in and out breaths, which lack a common point of contact, hence it earns only 800 merits. When your tongue propagates mundane and supramundane wisdoms, though language is restricted, the meaning is inexhaustible, hence this organ registers all the 1200 merits. When your body feels that it is touched, the feeling exists when there is touch, but vanishes in its absence. Hence, your body has only 800 merits. As intellect embraces both the mundane and supermundane of the past, present, and future in the ten directions, including all the worldly and saintly, without limits, you should know that this organ earns a full 1200 merits. Ananda, as you now wish to go against the samsara current of desire, you should revert to the very organ from which it flows until you reach the state beyond birth and death. Therefore, you should look into the six functioning organs and see which one is consistent or not, is deep or shallow, and is all-penetrating or deficient. If you find the all-pervading organ, you should turn back its karmic flow so that it accords with its penetrating quality. The difference between realization by means of this penetrating organ and that through a deficient one is comparable to that between a day and an eon. I have now revealed to you the six organs arising from your true mind and their respective potentialities so that you can choose the one most suitable to you and advance in your practice. All the Tathagatas practiced self-cultivation through the eighteen realms of sense to realize Supreme Bodhi. To them, all these eighteen objects of meditation were suitable for their practice. But your quality is inferior, and you are unable to use them to win supreme wisdom. This is why I now teach you to choose a suitable organ for your deep meditation. Once you have entered it and freed yourself from illusion, all your six organs will become pure and clean simultaneously. Ananda asked, World Honored One, how can one, by going against the samsaric current, enter deep into a single sense organ, so as to ensure that all the six senses become pure and clean simultaneously. The Buddha replied, Although you have realized the state of stream entry, or Shrota Apana, and wiped out worldly views, you are still not yet clear about the inner thoughts that have accumulated since the time without beginning, the elimination of which can be made only by practice and training. Still less are you clear about the inner illusions of birth, stay, change, and death to be wiped out during the successive stages of bodhisattva development. Now, look at your six organs. Are they one or six? Ananda, if they are one, why cannot you see with your ears, hear with your eyes, walk with your head, and speak with your feet? If they are six, then, as I expound the profound dharma, which one of them receives my instruction? Ananda said, I use my ears to listen to it. The Buddha said, If so, your ears should have no relation with your body and mouth when your mouth asks for its meaning, and your body stands up to receive it reverently. Therefore, they are neither one ending in six, nor six ending in one. In other words, Basically, your sense organs are neither one nor six. Ananda, 
you should realize that your organs are neither one nor six, and that, because you have seen everything upside down since the time without beginning, the illusion of one and six have arisen from that which is perfect and clean. Although your attainment of the state of Shrota Apana has wiped out the illusory concepts of six, you still retain that of one. This is like the void contained in different vessels and called by different names according to the shapes of the containers. If you throw away the vessels and look at the void, you will say that it is one. But how can the void follow your discrimination to become one or many? Still less can it become one or none. So your six active organs are like the void in different containers. Because of light and darkness, which alternate and reveal each other, their adhesion to the wondrous perfect mind results in perception, the essence of which reflects forms and unites with them to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, and is called an eye, which is shaped like a grape. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of forms. Because the conditions of disturbance and stillness contrast with each other, their adhesion to the wondrous perfect mind results in hearing, the essence of which echoes with sound and unites with it to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements and is called an ear which is shaped like a young rolled leaf. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of sound. Because of the two alternating conditions of clearance and obstruction, their adhesion to the wondrous perfect mind results in smelling, the essence of which responds to odor and absorbs it to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements and is called a nose, which is shaped like the claw end of a hammer. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of smell. Because of changing and unchanged conditions, their adhesion to the wondrous perfect mind results in tasting, the essence of which responds to flavor and absorbs it to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements and is called a tongue, which is shaped like a crescent moon. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of taste. Because of the alternate conditions of contact and separation, their adhesion to the wonderful perfect mind results in feeling, the essence of which responds to touch and unites with it to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements and is called a body, which is shaped like a trunk, narrow in the center. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of touch. Because of the two successive states of creation and destruction, their adhesion to the wondrous perfect mind results in knowing, the essence of which clings to Dharma and unites with them to become a sense organ. This organ originally comes from the four fine elements and is called an intellect, which is like the perception hidden in a dark room. Hence, this organ of perception is in constant search of Dharma. Thus, Ananda, these six sense organs cause the enlightened Bodhi to become subjective awareness, so that it misses its essence by clinging to falseness. This is why there is no substance of seeing in the absence of both light and darkness, no substance of hearing without both stillness and disturbance, no nature of smelling in the absence of clearance and obstruction, no taste without changing and unchanged conditions no feeling of touch beyond contact and separation, and no prop for knowing in the absence of creation and destruction. You have only not to follow the states of stillness and disturbance, of contact and separation, of changing and unchanged conditions, of clearance and obstruction, of creation and destruction, and of light and darkness and from these twelve worldly conditions just root out any one of your six sense organs to disengage it from both inner and outer adhesion. As soon as it is subdued and brought back to the real, the latter's light will appear. 
When the bright nature manifests, the other five adhesions will be completely rooted out and you will be free from wrong views created by the sense data. This light does not follow the sense organs, but manifests through them, and so all the six organs function through each other. Ananda, do not you see in this assembly Aniruddha, who is blind but sees, Upananda, who is deaf but hears, the goddess of the Ganges, who is noseless but smells, Gavampati, who does not taste with his tongue, and the god of Sunyata, who has no body but feels touch. This god of the void appears temporarily in the Tathagata light. Since his body is like air and does not exist materially, he has realized stillness or dhyana derived from the elimination of the second and third aggregates, thereby achieving the peace of the Shravaka stage. And Mahakashyapa, who is here, succeeded long ago in rooting out the organ of intellect, thereby realizing perfect knowledge which does not derive from the thinking process. Ananda, if all your sense organs are rooted out, your inner light will appear. All transient sense data, as well as the changing conditions of the material world, will vanish like ice melted by boiling water, and you will realize Supreme Bodhi instantly. Ananda, if a man who sees with his eyes suddenly closes them, darkness will appear before him, screening all his six sense organs, including his head and feet. If he then feels his body with his hands, he will discern his head and feet, although he does not see them. This shows that his knowing is the same whether he sees something in the light or nothing in the dark. That which does not rely on the light to manifest is not affected by darkness. After all organs and sense data have vanished, why cannot you realize the perfect and absolute enlightened Bodhi? Expedient Instruction on the One Mind Ananda said, World Honored One, as the Buddha has said, the causal ground used as the point of departure in quest of reality should be compatible with the fruit ground. World Honored One, Though realization of the fruit ground is called by seven different names, Bodhi, Nirvana, the Absolute, Buddha Nature, Immaculate Knowledge, Amala Vijnana, Immaterial, Tathagata Store, the Great Mirror Wisdom, it is pure, clean, and perfect, and its substance does not change like the royal diamond, which is permanent and indestructible. Now the faculties of seeing and hearing have no independent nature in absence of brightness and darkness, stillness and motion, and clearance and obstruction, and are like the thinking mind which ceases to exist in the absence of sense data. How can they be used as the point of departure in the search for the Tathagata's seven permanent fruits? World Honored One, seeing ceases to exist in the absence of light and darkness, like the thinking mind which comes to an end when there are no external phenomena. As I look into all this, I search in vain for my mind and its objects. What then should I set up as a cause in my quest of Supreme Bodhi? Does the Tathagata's previous teaching on the nature of seeing, which is profound pure, perfect, and permanent, contradict your true words, and become sophistry as well? Will you please be compassionate enough to clear away my delusion and perplexity? The Buddha said, You have widened your knowledge by hearing, but have failed to get out of the stream of transmigration completely. Though you know the cause of your upset, yet when you find yourself in the presence of that cause, you fail to recognize it. Lest your trustfulness remain incomplete, I will now do something to clear away your doubt and suspicion. The Buddha then ordered Rahula to ring the bell and asked Ananda, Do you hear it? Ananda and the others in the assembly replied that they did. When the bell was no more heard, the Buddha asked again, Do you still hear it? They all replied that they did not. 
Raoul again rang the bell, and the Buddha asked, Do you hear it? They replied that they did. The Buddha then asked Ananda, What do you mean by hearing and not hearing? Ananda and the others replied, If the bell is rung, we call it hearing, and when the sound and its echo stop, we call it not hearing. The Buddha again ordered Raoul to ring the bell and asked Ananda, Is there any sound? Ananda and the others replied that there was a sound of the bell. A little later, when it could no longer be heard, the Buddha asked again, Is there any sound? They all replied that there was none. Then Raoula rang the bell again, and the Buddha asked, Is there any sound? They all replied in the affirmative. The Buddha then asked Ananda, What do you mean by sound and no sound? Ananda and the others replied that if the bell was rung, there was sound, and when both the sound and its echo stopped, this was called no sound. The Buddha said, Why did you talk so wildly? Ananda and the others asked, Why do you say that we talked wildly? The Buddha said, When I asked you about hearing, you spoke of hearing, and when I asked you about the sound, you spoke of it. So merely about hearing and sound, your answers were ambiguous. How could they not be called wild? Ananda, when both the sound and its echo ceased, you said there was no hearing. If there really was no hearing, its nature would have died and would be like a withered log. But when the bell was rung again, how did you hear it? Existence and non-existence concern only the sound which may be present or not. But how can the nature of your hearing follow your discriminations to exist or not? If it really ceased, who then knew there was no sound? Therefore, Ananda, in your hearing the sound may exist or not, but this does not mean that the sound, whether heard or not, can cause your hearing to exist or not. In your delusion you mistake the sound for your hearing, and so regard the permanent as transient. You should not say that hearing has no nature when it exists apart from the conditions of disturbance, stillness, obstruction, and clearance. For instance, when a man sleeps soundly, if people pound rice, he may hear the beating of a drum or the ringing of a bell. So when asleep, he might find it strange that the bell is like the beating of a piece of wood or stone. But if he suddenly wakes up and hears the pestle, he will tell his family about his mistake when asleep. Ananda, does that man remember in his sleep the conditions of stillness, disturbance, clearance, and obstruction? Although his body rests, the nature of his hearing is present. Even when your body perishes and your life comes to an end, how can this nature vanish? For since the time without beginning, all living beings have followed forms and sounds and pursued the flow of their thoughts without awakening to their pure, profound, and permanent nature. By straying from the permanent and by following birth and death, they have been contaminated with defilements in successive lives. If you only keep away from samsara and dwell in real permanence, your eternal light will appear, thereby causing your organ, sense data, consciousness, and mad mind to vanish simultaneously. The objects of your thinking process are polluting dust, and the feelings that arise from your consciousness are impurities. If both are kept away, your dharma eye will appear pure and bright instantly. Why then cannot you realize supreme bodhi?